Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Two Stewards Show, and uh, I'm here with Brent. Hello, Hello everybody. Lovely Brent. Yep. My name's Mark, and we have a special guest today, and uh, that, his name is Mike Hutton, and uh, it is Mike Hutton, right? Yes, it is okay. Mike Hutton. That's right. You yeah, got okay. it. <laughs> I forgot there for a, had a senior moment. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, Mike's a farmer. Like my, I feel like your beard. Yeah, my beard. But Mike's got. I have beard, beard envy right now. Yeah. I have to confess. <laughs> You're at least trying. I'm not trying. It's the evolution of beards, you know. <laughs> uh, for those who aren't uh, watching, Mike has a you know a, 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 he's got a beard. It's a good beard, yeah. but it's like a regular length. Yeah. And Brent just has some Sounds stuff. a little condescending. It's kind of utilitarian. <laughs> it's utilitarian. He's got to do work for a living. You know? yeah, that's, yeah, you don't want to get it like stuck in front yeah, that's of right. equipment. Right? Yeah, that's right. Cotton the thresher or whatever you guys use. I don't know. That's the only piece the of farm equipment The sickle. I know. <laughs> sickle. The sickle's okay. That'll just cut it. Okay, but anyways, we, uh, we want to talk about farming. And uh, just the... <laughs> I don't know. We were having a little conversation beforehand. We we're talking about centralization and how that affects uh, so many different areas of our lives. We've talked about central banking. Well, okay. The reason we want to have Mike on is because we're talking about um, the negative impacts that our monetary system is having on different aspects of our society. Because um, we've kind of pointed out, I think, the last episode. Um, the negative impacts that uh, poor quality money has on uh, politics and education yeah and we kind of save farming for a different one because we're definitely not farmers or <laughs> very much <laughs> very well versed in that so we're like we could just talk for an hour about it but why don't we have somebody who actually knows a little bit about farming on? yeah so that's why hey why don't we talk to mike okay well let's talk to mike so mike what do you do <laughs> welcome to the show first of all. welcome to the show <laughs> thank what you do you do what do i do who is mike who is mike all right, I guess that's my cue. Um, so I've got a bit of a, I expected this question. Yeah. So I've got a bit of a, a thing for you here. Okay. You're um, our most prepared guest so far. <laughs> More prepared than us. Yeah, I think he's our only guest. <laughs> Anyways. Well, we'll see how this, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> so um, I want to talk about how unlikely I am to be in the position that I'm in. So. First, I'm an unlikely, I feel like I'm an unlikely podcast guest or presenter right. or something like that. Um, reason so for that is, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> wherever the Lord leads, right? right. Um, so the reason for that is, and I, I want to specifically bring something up here. Um, for about 15 years, I've seriously struggled with anxiety in these types of situations. So um, I want to bring that up because I feel there's more people who also struggle. But what I want to say is that we don't have to be ashamed or embarrassed of our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. Um, God says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. So um, I was convicted just recently, like a few weeks ago, that this meant that I had to get out there. And if my weakness showed, then hopefully that magnifies God's strength. So yeah. I see myself as an unlikely guest here, but I'm here for a, for a purpose. Um, I'm also an unlikely farmer. I grew up on a farm. Uh, when I was growing up, I did not want to what, be uh, a farmer. What kind of farm was it? I grew up on a chicken farm. Okay. My dad was a chicken farmer. He still is a chicken farmer. Um, he's doing very well in that industry, but I did not want to be on the farm at all. I was not interested in staying. Uh, pretty much all my teenage years, early 20s, I was committed to getting away from farming. Um, now I've been on the farm for six years. I've found my passion in it. I'm extremely excited with what we're doing. Uh, it's something that I would have never predicted. Um, I'm an unlikely father and husband. Uh, again, in my twenties, I was like, I'm never having kids. I'm never getting married. <laughs> I was, I, I was in the military. I was focused on the military life. Thankfully that didn't pan out. And now I'm married to a great woman and I have four young kids, four, four boys that uh, are wildly busy, but so much fun as well. So I'm extremely wow. thankful that... Um, four kids, that's crazy. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm extremely thankful for them. Um, it is, it's very busy and my wife is very busy with them for sure, but it's a lot of fun. How old are they? Uh, the oldest is five and the, <laughs> oh, and the youngest is seven months. Okay. So they're packed in there. It's... Uh, 
it's amazing. Um, they are best friends and worst enemies with each other, and they provide lots of tears <laughs> and frustration, but also just so much joy. Yeah. Uh, they're such a blessing. Yeah. So, um, Did you get them out there doing farming too? We will. That's definitely a part of our whole mindset with the farm, for sure. Get them working on the farm. Yeah. Um, so, so that gives you two can hate farming and say they'll never do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope to show them a different, yeah, different farming. Yeah, that okay. farming is actually is actually beautiful and is exciting. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, man. we're glad you didn't chicken out and that you uh, showed up here today. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so you have a farm. You're a farmer. Yeah, yeah, I'm a farmer. Tell us about the farm. Okay, so well, what is it called? Yeah. So the farm started as Providence Poultry, a good Christian name there. Um, so I started in conventional poultry. My dad got me the inn there, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I started in that after uh, finishing university. Yeah. I didn't really know where I was going. So I was planning to start a business, didn't know what to, I was kind of exploring some options, and then my dad gave me the sales pitch for farming. So I was like, well, it seems to be a decent option. And so he's a good salesman. So he's, he's, there you go. Yeah, he is. That's right. He's pretty uh, persuasive. So I got into chicken farming. Um, and then through a two or three year process, I decided to change the direction of the farm. Well, because you said conventional farm. Like that's where you started. Conventional right, farming. Conventional. When you say conventional farming, like for people who don't know what. Sure. Like farming versus other kinds of farming, what yeah. would that be? I don't know. Like, I didn't know there was different kinds of farming. <laughs> yeah, oh, there is. <laughs> um, so conventional farming. What I mean by that is, uh, or first I'll contrast it with perhaps what we might think of as farms, like the old McDonald's style farm, where there's a red barn and there's a couple cows and some sheep and some chickens and a horse and maybe a dog, whatever, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, E-I-E-I-O, that's okay. right. I know it's, that one. So, we, got, we got young kids too. <laughs> there we go. It's like, it's like how we introduce children to farming, but that's not at all what we see on farms today. What we see on farms typically today is that if you are a chicken farmer, you grow chickens. If you are a beef farmer, you grow beef. There is very, very little diversity um, to, to kind of it's go almost, a little bit. Uh, it's almost bleak like you drive by a chicken farm and it's just one barn yeah like five barns in a row and the grass is like the grass know, is short short yeah there's a gravel thing with a propane tank or some sort of yeah. fuel tank to <laughs> it's not it's definitely not an idyllic space yeah. right um and the, there's a reason for that it's because over the past 60 or 70 years we have thought it most efficient to produce one type of animal in one space and there is efficiency there right so the way that's, uh, or the word we use for that in agriculture is, is that it's called a monoculture, where you're, where you're growing one type of animal or plant in one space. So there's no diversity. It's just one, one type of chicken in a barn or say one type of corn in a cornfield, that right. idea. That's what I mean by conventional agriculture. Right. It's very conventional. It's very efficient. You can produce a lot of calories with uh, very very low man hours because uh, in a sense farming like that's the goal to produce calories or that's <laughs> let's talk that's about a great <laughs> question <laughs> um, i'm a calorie farmer <laughs> <laughs> you're a calorie consumer mark <laughs> there are no calories in coke zero okay, okay. <laughs> we've been over this before by coke zero <laughs> zero <laughs> calories <laughs> oh man zero calories <laughs> Are there uh, Coke farmers? Not that kind of Coke. Different kind of Coke, I think. It's a different kind of culture. All right, let's get back to conventional farming. Okay, so, uh, I mean, let me just, just ask the question. Like, what's the problem with conventional farming, right? It seems, it seems Mike, like you have a problem with conventional farming. <laughs> And um, so, I mean, just for the average person out there, like when I think of a farm, I think of like, yeah, fields of corn or yeah. grain or whatever, yeah. right? Like we got to feed the world. How yeah. are we supposed to do that? Totally. If uh, we're not being very um, efficient and industrialized. Sure. Um, so you're exactly right. Um, conventional farming has done a lot over the past 60 years. Uh, right now, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, if you guys have heard this, but there is 
We produce more food than is necessary to feed the whole world. The only reason we who uh, globally, just okay. just speaking as a global populace, yeah, the people of the world produce more than enough food to feed themselves. The only reason for starvation today is either logistical or political. Hmm. Um, so there's no reason, there's no actual reason that someone should die of starvation. Um, so even like the people who are dying of starvation in Africa, we're actually making enough food for them. We just, yes, it's not getting there. Current estimates are that we're producing enough food for between 10 and 14 billion people. Wow. So possibly enough to feed the world twice over. Um, now a lot of that ends up being wasted, uh, food waste that we all throw out. Yeah. Whatever. That's, that's kind of a normal part of life. But there's also all sorts of logistical problems with actually getting the food to the people who need it. And then there's also all sorts of political problems with uh, corruption in politics. And, uh, yeah. They're kind of unnecessary barriers to right. getting that food where it needs to be. Right. Or, yeah, exactly. And, and then there's North America who actually does consume twice over what they do. <laughs> <laughs> but probably not the things they should be. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and that all factors in. So we do have to recognize that conventional agriculture ha does produce a lot. Um, but now, what are the problems with it? So there's, I think I'm going to highlight two main problems, two predominant problems. One is that many people think that with conventional agriculture, you're basically mining soil fertility. Um, you're continuously growing annual grains. So by annual grains, I mean things like uh, corn, wheat, soybeans, um, which are staples in our diets. By continuously growing them on the same piece of land, you are taking the soil fertility out of that soil and you're going to turn that land basically into unusable land land that's no longer suitable for agricultural use and that is happening not you're not doing that intentionally not intentionally like you're that's kind of a side effect of right trying to produce the most right yeah but you just add fertilizer and you're good right sure um so that is the that's the conventional model you add npk uh there's one scientist i'm blanking on his name but there's a scientist a number of years ago who said that plants grow because of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So you only need those, <laughs> those elements and yeah. you can put them in soil in their synthetic form and plants will grow just fine. But that uh, does it, it doesn't acknowledge the complexity inherent in nature. Um, there's so much more that uh, healthy soil needs. So one of the perhaps more accurate measures of healthy soil just i'm not going to get too far into it because this is a huge topic on its own yeah. but it's organic matter or how much organic matter is in the soil how much life is in the soil and by continuously farming it the way conventional agriculture does you're taking that life out of the soil um, healthy soil would be something like say five percent organic matter to put a number on it um, whereas a lot of the fields that are being continuously farmed the way we expect the way that has been done over the last 40 years you're looking at 1% organic matter or, or less. And it, as it decreases, you have a tougher time to actually get your yields off of it. Hmm. So um, my take on it is that conventional agriculture is just not sustainable long term. We've done it now for two generations or so. Uh, but if we think, what if we do it for four generations? What if we do it for longer than that? Are we going to be able to keep this up? I say, right. no, we can't. So when you say conventional <clears throat> agriculture, it's really not that old. It's not that old at like, all. Like, where did this idea come from? Because we've been um, eating food out of the ground for how many years now yeah. as a human species? <laughs> okay, I'm thinking back to, uh, like, we're really digging deep here. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, or hopefully no digging at all. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here we go. You know, I'm thinking back to when, um, uh, like, I don't know, letting the land lie fallow was like, and I'm going back to like middle ages here, right? Yeah, yeah. That was a big apparent, I don't know much about farming, but... Um, and a scriptural thing too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let the land lie fallow. But I know like crop rotation or whatever, that was like a big advancement in farming apparently. I, this I don't know where I'm getting this from. Some course that I took at some point, right? When they mm -hmm. were like, no, you got to like rotate your crops and let the land lie fallow for a little bit. And that was, that really improved productivity in farming. 
in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. So, like, haven't we been doing this? Because they would presumably be, be growing one crop, no? Haven't we been doing this for centuries? No. No. Oh. Right. So, that changed uh, in a pretty big way early on in the 20th century. So, early on in the 1900s particularly with the increase of mechanization on farms. So I'm talking tractors, uh, tractors that can pull plows, stuff like that. Prior to that, it was very energy intensive. I mean, it still is energy intensive. We just have access to cheap energy from yeah. fuel. Um, it's very energy intensive to actually uh, grow a crop on any section of land. It either takes a lot of manpower with hoes and stuff like that, or you're using um, oxen or horses to pull a plow through the ground. Yeah, there's they only, need to eat too. So they need like to this. eat as well, yeah. yeah. So there's only so much land you could actually plow. Um, so what you would, those cultures typically would have eaten a lot less grains than we do. Um, and their animals would have also not eaten grains, but they would have grazed instead. So, uh, so were they rotating through pastures then? Um, Possibly. I don't know if that's fair to ask you. I would say long term, perhaps not year to year, because yeah. again, you don't want to you don't want to have to break ground if you don't have to. Yeah. So if you break ground, presumably they would farm that land for say five or six years. If you think of ancient Israel and 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 um, I don't want to get it too heavily into <laughs> theology because there's some there's some uh, controversy here too. But if you think ancient Israel and God prescribed rest for the land as well. Right. So you would presumably break ground uh, and then for six years you would farm that land and then let it lie fallow for the seventh year. But probably you would end up plowing the next piece of land beside it yeah. because you're letting that land lie fallow and that land is of course going to grow all sorts of weeds and all sorts of stuff and it's going to regenerate through that process. And then rather than plowing that land again, you'd plow fertile pasture land right beside it and allow that, that original plot to turn back to pasture. Um, remarkable thing about uh, grazing animals, so particularly cows, sheep, those style of animals, they, um, like it's, it's amazing at how well they develop soil fertility. It's not just through their manure that they deposit yeah. on the ground as they go, but it's also through how they, the, they eat the actual grasses. Um, they're right. amazing at developing soil fertility. It's like they were designed like that. Almost like they were designed like that. <laughs> we exactly. should have very high soil fertility in Ottawa, I'm just saying. You <laughs> talk about the amount of manure that's being produced. <laughs> anyway, let's carry on. <laughs> probably is good soil underneath all that concrete. <laughs> well, Turn the House of Commons into a farm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I have I can't so, I have no input on that. <laughs> it's all hooked <laughs> up. No um, okay, so I'm thinking of uh, sorry I, I I really love uh, antiquity. I don't know it's a common theme, but I'm thinking sure. of uh, Egypt as the breadbasket of the world. I mean, not the whole world, but the uh, Egypt produced a ton of grain, but I think that was mostly. Um, I guess mostly from the Nile flooding. The Nile area. Yeah, yeah. Kind of replenishing the land, right? Uh, yeah, because outside of the Nile, you, you can't grow anything. So interestingly, this is very interesting. Um, there's decent evidence to say that the Sahara was at one point grassland. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a very, um, what's termed a brittle environment. Uh, so it receives a lot of precipitation at uh, all in one time of the year rather than throughout yeah. the year. Uh, okay. um, but then also through overgrazing and over farming, it turned it into a desert. Now there's, uh, again, to use just, just an example of what's possible with agriculture, there's a guy named Alan Savory who, uh, using grazing animals, he actually turned desert back into, into grassland. Oh, yeah? Um, which Recently. is... Yeah, recently, like in the, uh, I want to say 1970s. Okay, I want to get to why exactly that's super interesting or important. Because for our listeners, they're like, okay, well, like grassland, whatever, this and that, like turning <laughs> it back and forth. But because you mentioned off the top how like uh, farming is, like, conventional farming, I guess, is producing calories. We're trying to produce enough for the world to eat. Um, but with the introduction of mechanization, like you said, you have... Um, kind of this mining process you're pulling nutrients out of the soil mm -hmm. um, and you're not replenishing them mm -hmm. but you're kind of maintaining the production capability of the soil with fertilizers or artificial means yes. 
and I guess you could maybe say similar stuff for um, like animals as well, right? Where you're monocropping animals or whatever. Monoculture. Yeah. So yeah, animals are raised in a monoculture. So think a chicken barn. Yeah. For example. Um, so, what what is the problem there? Is it all about soil quality? That's kind of um, like I think you had multiple points on what makes yeah. for different types of farming, but. Yeah. Is that the, the other thing, the first point is like, that's the first quality. point, soil quality. Um, the second point, I'll make these points quicker is that nutritional quality. Um, the food we grow now is nutritionally less dense than it could be. Right. Um, we are prioritizing things like yield. Um, so for corn yield per acre, uh, doesn't matter what's in that corn. We're just prioritizing yield. And we're also prioritizing things like, uh, producing food that's shelf stable or that stays good over long transportation distances. So if you have a tomato grown in California and it sits on a truck for however long to get here to our grocery stores, yeah. that tomato, if, if I did that with one of my garden tomatoes, it would be mush. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you can tell the quality. If you pick up a, a grocery store tomato or versus a tomato I produce um, and you take a slice from each one, you can tell which one is better, yeah. just like that, right? So we're prioritizing things other than nutritional density in our food. So the food that we eat is um, less nutrient dense, which leads to long-term health problems or can lead to long-term health problems. Yeah. A lot of the proponents of what I'm trying to do with the farm, uh, the goal they say is to produce food that is uh, so healthy that it acts as medicine. So rather than wow. turning to, say, pharmaceuticals, turning to typical North American healthcare, you just eat good quality food and a lot of your health problems kind of disappear. Uh, and then the other thing on top of that is that uh, this style of farming is better for the animals that we work with as well. Right. Um, how do you measure how nutritionally dense something is? Nutritional tests. Um, so you can send it into a lab. <laughs> me. <laughs> is it, yeah, and that's no problem. I had to look into it too. Um, you can send them into a lab. There's a lab in Toronto that'll give you a whole nutrition panel for whatever food you send in. And what, so what is it measuring? Like the amount of vitamins in exactly. something? Exactly. Okay. Um, so it's not only measuring your macronutrients, which would be your protein, fat, and carbohydrates, but then it's also measuring the, the mineral composition, things like magnesium, calcium, stuff like that, all the essential stuff that we need, uh, and then your vitamins as well. Exactly that. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so you're saying there's less of that stuff probably in, in your previous, in a tomato grown in California that's been ripening on the truck basically. Right. Versus uh, your, your tomato that's like right. grown and fully ripe and ready to go, but you better eat it within like a week or something. Right, exactly. And there's a nutritional difference between those two. Yes. Now, I haven't tested any of my food. Yeah. I'm going off of uh, information that I've, uh, I've gleaned from other sources. Um, and I have seen nutritional tests and there is a clear difference. Um, I mean, it's kind of, it kind of makes sense, right? If you think of like bread, you just buying bread, right? I don't grow, <laughs> I don't grow my own bread. Um, <laughs> no, but I, like, I don't even, I'm thinking about it, but I don't make my own bread either. Right. But when you buy like decent bread versus, uh, I don't know, One not good bread. Like I know I can buy a loaf of bread and leave it, at, like open it up and have a slice and then come back in a week. And it's maybe a little bit stale, but it's still like essentially the same thing. And then... If I get some good fresh bread, like if I don't eat it that day, it's, the next day it's hard yeah. and maybe starting to go moldy yeah. because it's, um, but it's like, it's really good. Yeah. So to me, that kind of makes sense. Like yeah. if good stuff shouldn't last forever, it's yeah. like that McDonald's cheeseburger that like you leave for a year <laughs> and you come back and it's like a little bit smaller, but, still but the exactly same. the same. It's yeah. Like just, yeah. It's made of plastic or yeah. whatever. So that kind of, that kind of makes sense to me, right? If you're mm -hmm. growing food that is designed to be able to to be able to like last on a truck for three weeks or something like there's different requirements for that yeah absolutely and there is like we we pick our vegetables that we grow in our garden we pick them every year and we go through catalogs of different varieties of any type of vegetable because there are so many varieties and they're all bred for a specific purpose um, so that you can have 
varieties that are very disease resistant, or you can, ha you can pick varieties for flavor or for color or for uh, shelf stability, all sorts of things, right? Sounds like kind of similar to what we always talk about. There's trade-offs with different things. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like if you yeah. want yield in your crop production, then you got to trade off something, right? Like whether it's nutritional quality or density or whatever. You can't, you can't have both, or if you do, like you're going to be mining the soil then, right? Like there's going to be trade-offs there. And then you talked about the long-term sustainability of that plot of land. Yeah. Um, I think about that in our context where we are in Southern Ontario, like land's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious from that angle, like how do you, you said it's not sustainable to farm, but like, so what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're, people are buying these plots of land that are really expensive and then they're driving them into the ground, so to speak. So uh, they're already in the ground. Oh, okay. <laughs> so according to my numbers, the calculations I've done in my head, um, if you are a starting farmer in Southern Ontario, you can't get started. Right. Um, the cost of entry is just simply too high. You're looking at a minimum investment for anything in conventional agriculture being between five and ten million dollars and wow. then the return is just not high enough to actually make it work so the people who are carrying farms on are farming families that the farm gets passed down to the kids uh, where that the the equity was already made yeah maybe even as far as 100 years ago and that farm is just continuously passed on and because of that equity that was made hundreds of years ago those new farmers can buy more land, right? right? Because they hold that value already. But you say they almost have to buy land because the land they have is kind of being depleted. Right. So another thing I should bring up is that we might not necessarily see this in Southern Ontario because Southern Ontario is so fertile. Um, it's remarkably fertile. We receive precipitation throughout the year, consistent precipitation throughout the year. Um, we have phenomenal soil fertility. We receive continuous yeah. precipitation even in december <laughs> even in december where we've had how many inches of rain in the past like 24 hours <laughs> there's precipitation in the air you just breathe it in <laughs> uh, but there are other areas and there's um there's maps of land that are no longer suitable for farming because they've been farmed out really? uh, you can find these maps yeah there's there's areas in the states particularly and it's in canada too but there's areas that have been farmed out and they've been deemed no longer suitable for farming. Uh, so the farmers who own that land, wow. yeah, it's really interesting. The farmers who own that land are often the guys who are pushing, uh, I don't like the word progressive because it's so loaded, but they become the progressive farmers who are pushing for a change in agriculture. And oftentimes it ends up being a change that um, is focused on soil fertility and developing long-term soil fertility through natural methods like grazing animals, um, using organic uh, compost to develop soil fertility, those, those yeah. methods. Okay, so let's, let's just say we accept the premise that you gotta, and we should talk about what you do on your farm, but... Um, <laughs> we'll get there, um, <laughs> maybe. No, we're gonna switch from, let's say, these vast tracts of uh, land growing wheat or grain, and I mean, let's not even talk about soybeans, because honestly, we just shouldn't yeah. be... Uh, we shouldn't consider them food. No, exactly. Um, but no, if we switch to this sort of, sm I don't know, it would have to be kind of smaller scale, I would think, because you can't have like, I don't know, a, 100,000 acres of, uh, I don't know, like could you could you have 100,000 acres of sustainable farming? And would you get the same yields? And would it, so here, like here's my, looking at it from an economic standpoint, right? We need the yield, so we need to get a lot of grain do to a lot of people. Do we need the yield, I guess, need, is a, what's that? Do we need the yield is maybe a good question too. Uh, to feed well, the world. Yeah. Listen, let me make the okay, argument. Okay. He can destroy my uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> right? We need a lot of yield, very cheap so that we can feed people and just like keep the economy going, right? So if we switch to something like this, where you got a bunch of hippies like, you know, running around barefoot, this is my conception of sustainable Guilty farming, as charged. by yeah. the way, right? <laughs> running around barefoot and like a straw hat and like, you know, petting the pigs and stuff. And That's goes, like so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> um, like it's, it's that's kind of Adam and Eve more. were naked in the garden. Right? <laughs> yeah, they, well, maybe some, you gotta grow figs, so we're gonna have fig leaves. Um, but that <laughs> tomato you're talking about, I can get the, this tomato from California for like 25 cents. Yeah. And yours is pr probably going to cost a dollar 25. No. Yeah. 
So, um, I'm going to throw a theological question back at you. Um, you yeah. said there are trade-offs uh, for everything that we do. Yep. Is God not abundant in his blessings? Yes. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have to say yes. <laughs> yes. If we pursue his model, should we be able to expect abundance? Right? So, and what I'm specifically referring to here is that the model that God has shown in his creation is a model of diversity. Every ecosystem is, is wildly diverse, far more com complex than, than we can understand or the, the top scientists can understand. Um, they're, they're continuously finding a, a, another level of complexity to any ecosystem on earth. So if we farm in that manner where we are, we are guiding and manipulating diversity to work together to produce food, should we be able to expect abundance? My answer is yes. I could be wrong. Everything I say here, I hold the right to be wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> if someone wants to prove me wrong, that's fine. Um, I'm willing to be wrong. I think if I'm wrong, then I will slowly get closer and closer to the truth. So um, I hold the right to be wrong. Now, um, if we have an expectation of abundance through uh, some sort of sustainable farming, then we might just have to change our understanding of what abundance is. Right? And so what I mean by that, um, historically, people have spent anywhere from 25% to 100% of their income on food because they needed to survive. Yeah. Uh, a historical normal could be anywhere from 25 to 60%. We spend 11 to 14. Hmm. So puts it in a little bit of context how wealthy we actually are. Um, we're phenomenally wealthy here. And, and that is absolutely a blessing from God. Wealth is a blessing from God to be used for his purpose. Um, but when we're trying to penny pinch on, uh, or when we're trying to save a few dollars by buying a lower quality food, are we actually, like, is that actually beneficial? So that's the first point I'll, I'll make. Um, the second point is that over the past 100 years, all of agricultural technology, all of farming technology has progressed in one way, and that's to promote greater efficiency through the monoculture method. What would have happened if 100 years ago we developed technology to, um, to build very diverse farms that worked very well together? Uh, that might seem impossible, but it's not. So there's a couple technologies that I'll bring up right away that make my style of farming much more, much more attainable. Um, one is portable electric fence. Portable electric fence means you can, you can move electric fence very easily and move animals very easily on pasture. Right? Yeah. So rather than having animals just graze one area of pasture, it turns it's into the, a monoculture. The elimination of the shepherd. <laughs> Well, exactly. What about sheep dogs, man? Put so, kind of work. and uh, so, do they have pig dogs? <laughs> no, no pig thing. dogs. Sheep okay. dogs are very interesting. Um, <laughs> wild. Uh, what is it? What, what are they called? Livestock. Well, livestock protection dogs as well. Super cool to see them work. That's a tangent, though. Uh, <laughs> so, you, so you've got electric fence. Electric fence to to control grazing animals. You've got plastic in greenhouses to provide uh, season extension for growing crops. Uh, okay. Crops that normally wouldn't grow. So we can grow tomatoes here with greenhouse, uh, basically crop protection. I'm not talking a greenhouse where you're putting uh, fertilizer in water and growing vegetables hydroponically. I'm talking. Vegetables are still in fertile soil. They're just being protected by a greenhouse. Okay. Um, GPS trackers for animals. So you can control your grazing animals through GPS collars. That kind of technological development has only happened in the past 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. And it's um, really changed how unconventional farming can work. Hmm. Um, I had another point, but I forget it now. Yeah, I, I We're do. talking about, can we feed the world? So. Yeah. Um, on that point, can we feed the world? The can we feed the world, um, that whole idea was actually a marketing campaign uh, that was forwarded by chemical companies, fertilizer companies, in kind of the, the era of the 60s. Um, and it was basically used to promote their product. It was hmm. playing on the... Um, their product being like the fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. So it was playing on kind of the hearts, the morality of the farmers, yeah. saying, we have to be able to feed the world, so you need our product for the highest yields. 
Yeah. So then they would sell their fertilizer. Um, I have read several models of farmers who are doing things unconventionally that end up having higher yield per acre, total calorie yield, than like the highest possible corn yield. They're doing things very unconventionally. It's a very diverse model. It certainly takes more man hours to work, but it takes far less chemical inputs. It takes far less mechanization. It takes far less overhead. Um, so it is possible. There's guys who are growing uh, something like, just to throw out a number out there, $150,000 worth of vegetables on one acre um, through intensive management. Wow. Yeah, it's very interesting. There's, there's lots of people doing that. Um, we don't see and it a lot. Uh, and they're good quality. Yeah, very good quality. Like yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'm, that would be abundance. That so would be I abundance. Was, I was looking at uh, farmland in, it was in Tennessee. Because we were looking at property out there. And I, I'm trying to remember, like, if you bought farmland, you could expect to get, like, 30 bucks an acre uh, in rent. But, like, a year or something. It was something ridiculous. Yeah, was, like, yeah that's, that's probably about right. So you're talking about somebody growing $150,000 worth of product on one acre. Yeah. Um, because presumably, if I'm getting 30 bucks an acre in rent per year... Um, that farmer's not making a hundred thousand dollars per acre, no. right? He's making uh, much less than that. There's a reason He's producing much less than that, right? So a farmer who who let's say he cash crops, cash cropping that refers to just generally growing crops in field like we're used to, yeah. you're growing your corn or your soybeans or your wheat. Um, a farmer who cash crops, I don't know if you could make it on say 800 acres. I don't know if you could pull that off because oh, really? the, the overhead is so high. You need more. Um, so typically if you say like a farmer and his son are running a farm business, you're probably looking at something like 1500 acres that they're farming to actually run a business and provide for their families. Is that because you got to pay like half a million dollars for a, a tractor and another half a million for That's a combine? definitely part of it. Absolutely. Okay. The overhead is so high. Hmm. Yeah. Now, um, I'm going to throw out a couple names that probably don't mean anything, but if, you're, if your listeners are interested in it, they can dig into it. Um, so a lot of these ideas initially came from a guy named Joel Salton for me, and particularly his, bo his book, Folks, This Ain't Normal. So he, in that book, he outlines how our way of life and our standard of living that we have now is historically completely abnormal. Right. Um, it's only been around for about 60 years, Otherwise, it's, it's completely abnormal. So that was a very interesting book for me to read and recognize that, that the way we're doing things now is, is totally abnormal. Another book that I want to bring up, or another farmer, actually. But normal being, like, not historically. Historical. Like, because like, we talk about normal. conventional farming, that's kind of, like, the norm now. It's the norm now. But and it's, it's only the last 40 years kind of thing. Yeah, I would say 60, even going 60 into... Years. Like maybe extending as far as a hundred years, a hundred years ago, Some this places. stuff was really just developing because that's when you had the, the gasoline engine. Yeah. We didn't have tractors. And, right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, that book was very interesting for me to read another little bit of a different, uh, perspective is a guy named Jean Martin Fortier. He's a Frenchman. He's in Quebec. Um, he is growing a, like he has a market garden on, I think his total farm size is something like 10 acres, but what's a market I would have garden? 40 acres. <laughs> 40. Uh, so a market garden, basically, basically he's growing vegetables to sell at market, right? But he's growing it. He's gardening, which means that it's very intensive management, right? Um, intensive management is just a lot of work. A lot of work. You're, you're paying <laughs> okay. close attention to everything you're growing. Right. Um, he's managed to develop a very successful business out of it. And he's now become kind of the, uh, I don't know, he's one of the leaders in that area now. And he's written books and stuff. So you can read books written by him. But it's a very different idea of agriculture. I think he actually only farms something like three acres of his farm. Um, and it's very productive. And he's very well known for what he does. Hmm. Um, those are two names that are very, very accessible, very accessible people with their material and stuff. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm just There's thinking, right? One of the reasons we need to have like the Ukraine produce 
all the, like just so many things right going through my head right now because I'm thinking of like during COVID we had all these dire predictions that um, the you know certain nations I can't remember if it was Morocco or Algeria who produce a lot of I can't was it phosphates maybe um, that fertilizer yeah, for, production right. was going to plummet yeah and therefore grain production throughout yeah. the world was going to plummet and we we're all going to starve in the dark and mm -hmm. it was all going to be horrible yeah um, I mean okay so. I guess what what this what we're talking about without talking about is really centralization, right? When we centralize our, our I mean, we so we we're always talking about central banks, yeah, and um, the evils of central banking and how that has kind of ruined our system because centralized control in a in a corrupt system. And I mean, we have we're we're you know we confess that we're corrupt beings, yeah. Um, if you, it just makes sense when you centralize control, it's just it's going to go bad, right? Because we're right. not inclined to good, we're inclined to evil. So, right. um, you know, and I think well, we feel like we've established that pretty good, pretty well in our podcast as far as um, the centralization of money. But now we're talking about centralization of farming, right? And I think that you know, money, money is related to everything that we do, yeah, and uh, certainly to farming as well. So I'm just, I'm trying to work this out in my head now, right? If we, you know, people in Africa, we always use people in Africa, that's so broad <laughs> and whatever. But no, but like you always, you always have these images of these starving nations. A lot of them are in Africa, um, you know, waiting for that truck to get there with the sacks of rice. Often it's rice, but it could be other stuff too, right? Because they, they don't have anything. If we didn't produce all of this wheat and all this rice somewhere else and send it over there they would starve but like it's it just sounds to me like maybe there's a better way maybe we could have like local farms all over the place so we didn't need to ship tomatoes from california to ontario right. we could right. have our own tomatoes and they could have their own tomatoes right and then you could kind of change how you do farming as well. You wouldn't need to worry about shipping at long distances mm -hmm. or having a hundred thousand acre arm arm farm. <laughs> <laughs> the long arm, the long farm of the law. Um, no, but you're talking about this guy growing stuff on like three acres, or he's got a ten acre farm. Like that's just not. That's a hobby farm, right? That's just like well, kind of a joke. Yeah, that's really, what. When, that's what we would think. So. Um, there's guys in France. There's a couple guys in France. I just bought their book the other day. I haven't read it yet. But they're producing enough for two families on, I think, like something like three quarters of an acre. Um, just very productive, very intensely managed. And Are these guys actually producing or are they just selling books? It sounds like they're making money from. <laughs> Diverse income streams, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so to talk, to talk to your point, um, centralization of food production is a fascinating topic. Um, the world's biggest food company. Do you guys know what it is? I've got the stats up here. I don't know what year these Monsanto? are. Monsanto? So it's Cargill. So Monsanto's actually okay. a, a chemical company. Oh, uh, uh, I thought they grew stuff too, but. Very okay. closely linked to agriculture because they produce, um, I think probably they're the biggest producer of uh, glyphosate uh, pesticide or weed killer, which is yeah. Roundup, right? Monsanto produces Roundup. They're a huge company. Anyways, biggest okay. food company, by revenue is Cargill. Okay. Um, $113.5 billion revenue in 2019. That's a lot of revenues. Yeah. Wow. So um, there's something like, I don't, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but there is a majority of the food production worldwide, food production and processing worldwide, that's controlled by something like four actual companies. Um, so there's massive centralization in agriculture uh, and in food Reci production. And this is recent too. Like This is fairly recent, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> this is crazy. Because this was, <laughs> it was just not possible a hundred years ago. Yeah. Right? I assume these possible. are publicly traded companies more than likely. Probably. Okay. Um, okay. Archer Daniels is the next one with 64 billion. <laughs> Nestle is the next one with 64 billion. Nestle. Cisco, 60 billion. Um, and then it drops off from there. Um, but yeah, there's a few companies that, that control most of the world's food production. Uh, you can look back historically at why these companies became so powerful. You guys can probably guess. Yeah, it was that's my a lot next of, question. Yeah, was, why are they the only ones doing this? <laughs> well, it was things like uh, food safety regulations that 
force them to like imposed by governments um, that allowed these companies to grow very large and very powerful. When and, people say like food safety regulations are a good thing, like hey, aren't they? Not afraid to be safe. And regulated. <laughs> Do we? I don't know. <laughs> you tell me, Mike. I feel like you're going to tell me. <laughs> is, <laughs> philosophically, is safety a good thing? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> we have to have you on for another you answer. run around the farm with scissors? <laughs> <laughs> if they're running with scissors, we get them to hold them the right way. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Safety is a good thing. We have to. It's always important to start from a position of safety, but we shouldn't pursue safety as an end. Right. right? So if safety is our end, we're going to go some pretty bad places. And I think that might be a kind of an underlying philosophy for where we are as a society is we've pursued safety and efficiency as ends in themselves, not seeing them as byproducts of of doing what is right. 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 Um, So food safety. Uh, I can't, again, I can't verify this information myself. I haven't seen it with my own eyes. I've read it in books. The chicken you eat in the grocery store goes through a chlorine bath on the way out of the processing plant. Just in case there's any bacteria on there, they want to kill all that bacteria. So okay. the outside of the chicken comes out sterile. It's like me when I go in the hot tub, by the way. It's basically a <laughs> chlorine bath, and it looks a lot like a chicken afterwards, too. <laughs> but carry on, Mike. So I so there's a food safety regulation, and, and those... those Overbearing regulations make it very difficult for small processors to compete, of course, right? right. Um, regulation benefits the big guys. It, it, uh, like if you got to have a bath of chlorine, you might as well pump chickens through all day long. Right, like exactly. That's the point. And yeah. that's, that's just one example of right. a, a certain regulation. Um, now, I can't, again, I reserve the right to be wrong. A lot of this comes from Joel Salton. He's been in this. I've read a lot of his stuff, but he's been in this for a long time. Um, He will say that if a cow eats grass, there's a certain type of E. coli that's in its stomach that will not infect humans. And that E. coli is supposed to be in its stomach to help it break down the grass. If a cow eats corn, the type of E. coli changes so that the cow can break down the corn. And that is an E. coli that is poisonous to humans. That's toxic to humans. It can infect humans. So are the food safety regulations necessary? Well, perhaps they're necessary for our system. Uh, but perhaps if we were not farming with our system, we wouldn't need those food safety regulations or at least not as intensive. And then we could open the marketplace up to more competition. Hmm. And you see where all this is going. Of course, yeah. with greater competition, prices come down and everything else. Right. And you have more and diversity. You probably see more people farming as well. You though, see more people right? farming. The, yeah. the returns for farming get better. There's a yeah. reason that that. Um, kids that grow up on farms generally don't turn out to be farmers because yeah. it's not fun and it's not a great living. Yeah. Now, yeah. we can touch on supply management here because um, the Canadian poultry and dairy industries saw all these problems going on and said, okay, one, this is how we're going to try to fix it with supply management. Right? So that, that allows for at least a sustainable living for, for Canadian farmers. So just to clarify supply management is what exactly we should define that as well so (laughs) (laughs) the connection i was making there i'll go one step back the connection i was making there was with the the idea that generally farm kids don't want to be farmers right right because it's not a good living because a lot of farmers are scraping by and they're subject to all these (coughs) demands from massive multinational food processing companies that they just can't compete with these these processors have all the power Right. right, and farmers can't compete with that. Individual family farmers, they they just, well, they don't yeah. have the money to pay the legal fees for one, right? Um, so, so then there's various protectionist strategies used to try and make farming more profitable, so that or profitable. I was corrected on my pronunciation. Yeah. Really, profitable. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. I was going to start using it. <laughs> you like it? Yeah, profitable. Like it. <laughs> um, so one of the pre- protection strategies to make farming more profitable for Canadian farmers was the implementation of supply management. This happened kind of in, I want to say the 70s, somewhere in that era. Supply management is effectively a monopoly. So there's various boards. Um, I'll use dairy in Ontario. There's a dairy board of Ontario that holds a monopoly for dairy production in Ontario. 
And then they allow farmers who have the means of production, who have a farm, who own a farm and can produce dairy, they allow certain farmers to produce dairy. Those farmers are given generally what's referred to as quota. Those farmers are given quota to produce a certain amount of dairy every year. Right. And then there's, of course, requirements to, to meet their quota or at least within a percentage. And there's all sorts of requirements that come with that. Right. So, so you have I the mean, right to produce it and sell it. But if you don't produce enough of it, then... Then there's different, different boards have handled that different uh, ways. But generally, there's some sort of um, consequence if you penalty don't produce it. Yeah, some sort okay. of penalty. So I just have two things that come to mind. One is farmers pouring out milk because they're like, they produce right. too much. Yeah. Maybe that's their fault for producing too much. I don't know. Or maybe the regulations changed. But then I'm also thinking of these farmers who are getting persecuted um, for selling raw milk. Yeah. Because I guess A, it's not safe and B, it's not within the purview of the, I don't know, the dairy board, dairy board whatever sure. you want to call it. Right? Yeah. Dairy um, board is, yeah, exactly. And uh, I don't know, th those are just two things that kind of come to my mind that just like, they rub me the wrong way. Right. Right? Like, I, I understand, okay, if you band together and you have this association to, um, I don't know, like, number one, do we need, like, every country, I think, does this in some way, shape, or form. Almost every country has um, this protection for farmers. Yeah. And, like, I've often, I don't know, I haven't really delved into it, but I'm like, why? Why does every country do this? And they have, like all these tariffs and all this kind of stuff right. to, uh, to because protect. they can print money <laughs> well I'm just I don't know like the whole thing just doesn't sit well with me like right. why can't farmers just produce what they want and why yeah. do they need so much protection yeah. from like other farmers I, I don't know so why shouldn't farms be subject to free market conditions yeah. as opposed to having all these protectionist strategies put in place by the government yeah um, and that is a, it's a great question. You are right. There are a lot of countries that have some sort of protectionist strategy for their farmers. The, the States does it uh, primarily through subsidies. Um, they subsidize a lot of their agriculture quite heavily. Canada does it through tariffs and um, even I think Canada does it through preventing just straight up. There's certain products you can't bring into Canada, but then also through things like supply management. Um, supply management prevents or very much decreases the amount of chicken and dairy or generally poultry and dairy that you can bring in from the states it really decreases that it's very protectionist well on one hand i kind of get it because if the u.s is doing it and they're subsidizing their farms and stuff and now these guys can mass produce then they're just going to flood the market right. here yeah and like yeah then yeah. okay we have to do it right yeah it's a bit because of a game almost we got to protect our uh, farming industry because we want to have a farming industry right so we got to protect ours Right. So, yeah. What do you What do you do against the states? Right. Um, and I just just a pet peeve of mine. We're sort of on the topic is like cheese. You can't get good cheese in Canada unless it's like imported. And like, what? I mean, there is some local There's stuff some like the Oka yeah. and some of the stuff produced in Quebec. But I mean, just like what we call chip. What I grew up knowing as cheese. Right. We have two kinds of. Sorry, Brent. This is gonna give you shutters <laughs> but we generally have a couple different kinds of cheese in our house right we have plastic cheese that's what we call plastic cheese yeah. which is the slices and the kids are like oh is it because it's wrapped in plastic i'm like no because it is plastic is what you, <laughs> you might want. as well so, not take the wrapper off <laughs> yeah like you just leave the wrapper on it's the same thing but anyways <laughs> there's that which is clearly like just petro uh Byproducts, um, yeah, pretty much. As Safe Either says in his book, industrial sludge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then you have like you get the blocks of cheddar cheese, and that's what I kind of grew up like. Oh, this is cheddar cheese. Yeah. And then had some cheddar cheese. I was like, wow. Yeah. This is really good. Yeah. So we'll have that, and then we'll actually, we'll have for the adults in the house. We'll have actual like you know, Expensive. actual cheese, but none of it is made here. Right. Like very little is made in North America, for that matter. And mm -hmm. uh, this is one of my uh, things I don't like about life in America, North America, is their uh, cheese quality. And I know that's, you know, maybe a one-off thing. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's just a pet peeve because we sure. enjoy our cheese. It is mm -hmm. good. But we don't have it here, and I don't know why. Well, a, a big part of it is because so much of food production is controlled by a few companies. 
and they really determine what we eat. Unless you want to find that niche, small scale cheese maker somewhere in wherever, Northern Quebec, who has this like very fine cheese. And there are a few of them. You just have to look out for them and you be willing to pay the price for the cheese because they have to set themselves apart and they have to um, market themselves. And, but it's, it's so much more intense because even though they're creating a different product than you find in grocery stores, they still are competing against grocery stores. They have to. It's still food, yeah, right? Who's gonna, yeah, who's going to market it? Right. And so we're finding that with our farm too is that we're... We don't have the same audience as grocery stores. We don't have the same, um, not audience, the same customers as grocery stores, but we still do have to compete against grocery stores because we're producing food and grocery stores sell food. Yeah. Our food's different, but we still do have to keep that in mind. So, and it, it means that we have to put a lot more work into what we do and being intentional with it and actually convincing someone that it's worth it. It almost seems like there's two camps, like there's the conventional farming method with its customer base and the big box kind of grocery stores. And then there's like, you know, small niche, like yep. farming a three quarter or one to three acre plot of land with highly uh, nutritional food that has like a different audience for it. Yeah. And what I'm curious about is like, how do people figure this out? Like, if I didn't know about this kind of food or I, I didn't care what my tomato, like if I never saw another tomato and I, I just ate the grocery store one that was shipped from California, I wouldn't know any different. Yeah. Right. Because that's kind of how we grew up. It's just like these plastic cheese slices, you put them on your burger and it's like, yeah. you know, white bun and like there's no nutritional value yeah. in it maybe, but you know, it tastes good and let's eat another one. Right. Cause we need, cause we get hungry so fast. But like, how do you find out about this? <laughs> like, you have to listen to I our do. show. <laughs> like, Honestly, it's like, and this is actually one of the How reasons. How did you find out about This it? is one of the reasons <laughs> I'm here is because right. to, to like build awareness. And that's part of my goal with what I'm doing uh, on the farm. It's part of the mission statement yeah. is to develop awareness around this and, and allow people to see how wonderful farming can be and how wonderful the food can be as well, right? Um, I learned about it again. <laughs> I talked about how unlikely my life path has been. Um, this was a wildly unlikely path or a circumstance that allowed me to, to learn about it. Um, but of course, I don't believe in, in um, circumstance. I believe it's providential. Yeah. So it's a funny story. Um, I had read Thomas Sowell Basic Economics and I was opposed to supply management, uh, even though I was working inside of it. And I was like, I was basically of the attitude, okay, I'm here now. I don't really have another immediate option, so I'm going to stay here. I'm going to keep working it, keep tending it. Um, and then I had a friend come up to me at church, and he was all excited. <laughs> if he listens to this, it'll be hilarious, because I've never told him this story. Um, but he said, Mike, I've got a book for you, the book we were talking about the other day. I brought it for you. Um, I know you're really excited to read it. I was like, I don't remember talking about a book with you. <laughs> this book was called The Hobbit Party. And it was an uh, explanation of the worldview of J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay. Uh, and I was like... I like it already. <laughs> so I, I definitely did not talk to him about this, but he was really excited for me to read it. So I was like, okay, well, I, I feel like I have to read this now. A um, little bit of context. I had never read any of The Lord of the Rings. I think I read The Hobbit in school because I had to. I never watched any of the movies prior oh, to this. Hold on. How did this guy get on our podcast? Yeah, out the door, right? Hold on. There's a, there's a happy ending here, all right? <laughs> so I read the book, and I was blown away with, with the worldview that they presented as seen in J.R. Tolkien's work. Um, in that book, uh, Joel Salton was referenced as the farmer who... He, he wrote a book called um, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. And I was like, a farmer <laughs> and everything he wants to do is illegal? Like, what's wrong with this guy? I have to read his stuff. Yeah. Um, I finished The Hobbit Party, forgot about it. it don't worry, I'll get there. Okay. Um, something like nine months later, I was looking for something to listen to on my audiobook app. And Joel Salton popped up. I was like, <sighs> Joel Salton popped up. I was like, why don't I give him a listen? And then I listened to him and I was like, my mind was blown. I, like it, it was, a, it was definitely a turning point for me. Listening to one of his books, and I was like, "Okay, I, I have to learn more about this. What this, this different idea of agriculture is?" Because you're right, it's not presented anywhere. We've got the government yeah. presenting um, conventional agriculture as the way forward. They 
supported entirely with monopoly. With subs- yeah, with with enforcing monopolies, but also through subsidizations and uh, investment opportunities, and all these things that the government is doing to promote conventional agriculture. And then that's all we see in the grocery stores too. You really have to seek out something different, but to seek it out, you have to know it exists first. You have to know it's available. Yeah. Um, now, getting back to The Hobbit Party, that book um, cultivated in me I like it. <laughs> uh, a great appreciation for J.R.R. Tolkien. I ended up reading all the books, watching oh. all the movies. Phew. Uh, it's something that I'm going to read to my sons and everything else. So. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Ooh, happy ending, folks. Okay, I think we can end here. <laughs> the Hobbit part. Okay. That so this is a book not written by him, but it's no. about it. Like, it's about his world through view. his lens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, maybe we'll he, put some of these books in the pipe, show notes. Too. By the way, Mike. So I have been known to smoke a pipe. I don't do it regularly, but I, I do enjoy. <laughs> We'll definitely have to put these books in the show notes. You probably got more books, but it sounds like we need to be readers. I don't know. <laughs> I have a We need to be readers. Like, yeah, like, interesting. He's like, I it's never annoying, came across eh? this. It's until. annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the invention of the electric fence. You got greenhouse plastic, GPS trackers, and audiobooks. <laughs> now you can become a farmer. That's right. There you go. <laughs> <And> today, <laughs> really interesting. So on that point, actually, there, there is really... Nobody teaching this stuff. You can't take a uni- university course yeah. on this stuff. Can um, we go to kind of Stoke College and do a course on uh, sustainable yeah. farming? You can't enroll. You're not foreign. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting. We talked about this last time. There's like thirty thousand immigrants here coming. Or, yeah, yeah. Students. Just just to kind of Stoke. Anyways, carry on. Probably being paid for by the by the government, right? Uh, no, no, okay. no. This is a this is a cash crop for um, for colleges here for okay. students. Yeah. Anyways, um, tangent. I don't know what... Uh, oh, yeah. So I was saying there's nobody teaching this stuff. If you look for a sustainable agriculture course or a, uh, an ecological agriculture course, you might find a one-off course at certain universities yeah. across North America, but it is not common at all. Um, my uh, team member and I, so my main guy is Josh Slutes. Okay. Um, so he, we have very similar philosophies. We're finding we have to buy uni- or online courses that are developed by farmers themselves. Hmm. And they're trying to pass on the information and, and, of course, grow this style of farming. And that's where we're having to find actual practical peer, information. Peer to peer. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. totally agree, dude. Totally Forget agree. centralized learning. Do you think your kids would... See, we talked about education on the last one. Yeah. Centralized learning. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Bring back Socrates, and we'll all gather on the sustainable <laughs> farm. And uh, there we go. <laughs> um, do you think your kids would? Uh, I don't know. Do you think they'll have more of a chance of becoming farmers? Um, looking at what you're doing, uh, the way you're farming. I hope so. And the reason that I think they will be attracted for it is number one: there's almost unlimited potential. Uh, because the actual possibilities within agriculture, once you step outside of the conventional, is almost limitless. There's all sorts of possibilities for value-added product, like making cheese or um, doing spices. Or like you mean processing the food once you grow? Yeah, it, actual grow processing. It. Okay. That's right. Adding value to what you make, and right. you can do it on farm. Um, there's a lot of fairly simple stuff you can do. Um, so there's a lot of potential there, but this, the other thing that perhaps is more important is um, I've become very passionate about it. It's, it's a very beautiful way to farm. Um, seeing how a pig interacts, I, I can compare chickens raised in a barn versus the only livestock I've done inside, which is pigs. Seeing how a pig grows up in the forest and how it interacts with its surroundings is like phenomenally beautiful. It's like it, it blows my mind up. I will sit, like I've done it before. I try not to do it too much because I still do have to uh, be a little bit efficient. <laughs> but I can easily sit for 15 minutes and watch pigs in the forest. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing to, to see. Huh. Um, and it's the similar. If you have cows on pasture in their normal environment, if you have chickens on pasture, which is doable, um, it's a beautiful thing to see how they interact with their environment and how they integrate with everything around them. It's amazing. A chicken in a barn yeah. or a pig in a concrete stall in a barn, you do not see the animal as it was created to be. So then that 
yeah. it's another aspect of this is that we're actually, I, I think, and I've seen it myself, which is why I can say this definitively, we're missing an aspect of God's creative work if we put animals in barns. Mm. Now, it might be necessary to protect them from inclement weather or something like that, but if we entirely remove them from, an, from their natural habitat and put them in a completely manufactured habitat, I think, and I can say this because I've seen it in my own, my own self and my own perception, we're missing God's creative work. We're missing an aspect it's of it. It's like uh, the potential that could be achieved is being limited by... Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think back to the education thing we were talking about last time where we're talking about taking kids who are like, in their sense, in their creative play in their environment and we're putting them in a desk in right. a box in a... Yeah. Like, here you go. Yeah. We're driving by a school yesterday with my wife and it's like, no windows in it. And I'm like... That's a school, believe it or not. And she's like, I think there's windows on the other side. And we're like driving out. <laughs> there's like no windows in this school. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, that that's that's a very similar, right? In the sense, you're yeah. taking things out of where they're created to be and putting them in a thing to try and yeah. try and produce the max yield or whatever. And it's it's the same mentality behind it all, hmm. right? Um, monoculture children. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want your children? Wow. I, is, no, I agree. This is crazy. We, we always talk this about this, crazy. right? Yeah. The kid, whatever, the guy sitting there, um, this is one of our, our tropes that we go back to, right? But the guy sitting in his little apartment playing video games, eating pizza. Yeah. Um, and uh, probably on antidepressants as well. Yeah. Uh, Joey, always, Joey from Canadian Bitcoiners cheap. always talks about this, right? All these people sitting there. He, he, so he made this point the other day. <coughs> on um, a podcast, right? People who, <laughs> so this could be a very, I don't know, generalized, uh, uh, like a broad generalization, but like all these social studies, sciences majors. Because um, he is charged. <laughs> <laughs> you were one of them. <laughs> no, but who are getting pumped full of SSRIs, right? Antidepressants and, and all this stuff. And um, like, who have no... I don't know, no skills, no value to add. Like this is the basis. Everybody who's, I don't know. We, I, I've been, we've been talking a lot about like, can we live in, like can my kids live in Canada? Is there a future for sure. them here? Yeah. Or is everybody who's good at anything gonna eventually leave? And it's gonna be all these people that I just talked about yeah. um, who are gonna be like the tax base and the base of our country and have nothing of value to offer. Yeah. And the only thing we're gonna do is pump in another million immigrants a year. Um, but for a government, like if you're if you're the government, you're trying to like provide food for people and you're trying to make a society, it's easier if everybody just stays in their box and does their thing and we're gonna ship them grain and ship them antidepressants. Well, yeah, this, right? this is what it's I'm like. It's at. super easy, right? Send them the tax bill, they pay for that. Well, th it's statism, right? Yeah. This is if you want to That's manage crazy. a populace, you keep them sedated and you don't, <coughs> you have very clear boundaries mm -hmm. and whether it's the school and not, not against schools necessarily, um, but um, like don't, don't be outside the boundaries and this is how you produce your milk in your chickens and your whatever and um like let's not vary from that because right. that you know that doesn't uh, that doesn't work with our goals of the right. state yeah and it's just like yeah this sort of encroaching ever encroaching uh, state kind of yeah. um telling us what to do how to grow our food and like we see the results yeah right? since like the 70s for cancer. sure cancer <laughs> well the cancer the heart Diabetes. disease like all, all these things that just have increased as our, you know, farming efficiency, I guess, has increased. I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought to maybe bring farming into it, but it totally makes sense now. But as right. our, you know, as our money supply increases and how that affects everything that we do, right? Government couldn't subsidize farms if it couldn't print money. Farmers would have to right. kind of figure it out themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Turn a profit. So that would be, yeah, they'd be accountable to reality, right? Right. And in a sense, what you're doing is much more attuned to the way God created the the, the various animals and plants, right? It's, yeah. yeah. You're dealing with the biodiversity of the land or the quality of the soil, and you're trying to work with it. You're not trying to step in as like, I have the power right. to, with this chemical, make what I want. Yeah. It's like, we see that time and again, like... Let there be money, That's, right? Yeah. yeah, Lux. Let there be light. Like we don't have the divine power God does to just right. produce something valuable out of yeah. nothing, right? We have to work with what God 
we have to steward it, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that gets to the worldview that's at the bottom of all this, um, which is so important. Uh, we, we live in this culture and so often, uh, like there's loads of Christian farmers who farm conventionally, but there's an assumed worldview there. And we, we live in a culture and we assume that the culture is doing things correctly, but we forget about the worldview that the culture has. So the, the dominant worldview that has been in place uh, in North America for at least 60 years, but 100 years, and actually it's been in de development since the Enlightenment, is a, is a worldview that man is in control, right? Yeah. And we can control things and we can, we can develop the sciences so that we can train experts so that these experts will be able to control our, our money supply. They will know exactly how to control the money supply for optimal economic conditions or uh, experts that can tell us exactly how to raise food the best way possible, as efficient as possible. Experts that tell us how to raise our kids, uh, how to train them to be productive members of society. So we're relying on experts rather than relying on, I mean, on God's word. Ultimately, right? <laughs> Acknowledging that, no, we're actually not in on control. God expert. is in control. Yeah, exactly. The on the made, expert. The one who made yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. We're not in control. Yeah. God's in control. And we should be relying on him and, and his sort of created order, uh, his, his character that is displayed in all of his creation. We should be relying on that and, and trying to, to imitate that. Right? And by the way... How dare you have four children? Because don't you know, like mankind is a blight on the earth and it's not sustainable for us to have uh, this many children, right? Although we have to bring in immigrants to prop up our economy, we still should not have more than like 1.5 children per family or something, right? Because the right. population, uh, the, experts, the experts Malthus, say... Um, yeah, Malthus, <coughs> Malthusian economics, and and all this stuff before yeah. as well. But that all kind of ties into that sort of that sort of brave world new view, world, right? brave new world. Yeah, yeah, that's on the shelf. I haven't read that one yet. Oh, it's good. Okay. It's deadly. Well, I, I read 1984 right after reading the Gulag Archipelago. Oh, and then I was like, I'm not going to read Brave New World right yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> was that a sustainable farm, by the way, in 1984? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was just gonna say uh, I don't know what I was gonna. I was just gonna tangent on again, but just about worldviews and um, yeah. yeah, how man has the answer, and that's expressed in the form of a central government that kind of tells us what those answers are because yeah. there's no possible way we could have critical thinking but he, and think yeah, for ourselves. You probably see that though in your firm, like you probably see a situation where like, I think I know what's right here and I'm going to do it. And then you do it and you get the consequences back from your action, right? right. And you're like, wait a minute, these pigs didn't do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Like clearly I'm not in control here. Right. Yeah. But if you start introducing like fiat into this, then you're like, you can kind of kick the can down the road, right? You can say, look, Absolutely. the consequences aren't immediate. They're not apparent. They're happening to somebody else. They're not happening to me. So I can just ignore the problems that I'm creating with my you know, expert control mentality, right? right? I don't know well, if that's that, ringing a bell or well, no, <laughs> it makes sense. This is, this is entirely true because, so let's, let's compare a, I'm a farmer, so let's talk about farms. Let's compare a whole bunch of small scale farms spread out through the country that are all trying to to, and there's, there's, there's passage of information back and forth, but they're all trying to develop their own farm the best way they can. Yeah. Let's say uh, 20%, no, let's say 50% of those farmers are wrong. Um, they will see that on their farm and they will have to adjust. Right, right away. Now let's say that you get one of those farmers that was wrong, you toss him up as minister of agriculture and say, you have to tell all your farmers <laughs> how to farm. And he tells them how to farm and says, if this doesn't work out for you, we'll subsidize you. Don't worry. What happens? What if, what if all your farmers are wrong? Right? So, and this is, this is the problem with centralization of power, right? If you have centralization of power, what happens if that guy is wrong? And, and the, the, the you effect. add more fertilizer. <laughs> well, it, it reminds me of Maoist China, right? The great leap forward. I don't know if you study this at all, but they're like, we got to kill all these sparrows and uh, right. starvation ensued. Yeah. Right? Like, 
basically they, were, they had this campaign to kill all the sparrows in China because they're like eating grain or something. Mm-hmm. They didn't realize how they actually contributed to the ecosystem. Right. And uh, <laughs> like they're, everybody starved because they couldn't grow grain anymore. Well, And this was like the state being like, here's what we're going to do. It's just a stark example of yeah, and what it's you're talking the about. The same thing in communist Russia where like millions of people starved because the farmers were kicked off the land. The prosperous farmers, the farmers who could actually turn a profit, were kicked off the land because they had money. And then you had all these people come in and try farm. They didn't know how to farm, so there was a famine. Because turn a profit actually means... Means you have to be good at what you're pro- doing. Yeah, you're producing something valuable. Yeah, and, yeah. Exactly. yeah, what were they? The Kulaks, I think, right? Is yeah. what they called them? That's right. Anybody who... Because yeah. they owned land. Yeah, right. exactly. And we're productive. Or was a relative of someone yeah. who owned land or who yeah. even thought oh, about your, owning land. Oh, your grandpa <laughs> was a farmer. Well, right. Camp for you. Right, exactly. <laughs> and they were. it was assumed that they were, um, they were bad people because they owned something. They had taken advantage of someone else. Right. Now, this sounds all very... Oh, this sounds, that sounds crazy, right? That, come on, that couldn't happen now. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, just, we read the fall economic statement where they talked about how investors are driving the price of homes up and yeah. basically like these people who own stuff are uh, kind of bad. Investors who produce housing. And this, uh, you yeah. know, this is the reason that you're poor and that you can't afford groceries um, because of these people who, uh, you know, people who dare to own things. Yeah. And uh, anyways, that's... Uh, Another little little bit of a tangent, but um, <laughs> but yeah, you, you're right about the, the the government control. It's almost like taking a climate activist and making them the environment minister, so right. and <laughs> setting ridiculous goals for electric vehicles. So, it, like yeah. in your example of taking all these small farms across the country and pulling one guy out who might not know anything, making him the agriculture minister. If you if you flip it on its head, I'm guessing what you're implying by that is that well, it could be better actually to have. A diverse number of different farms right. with everybody making mistakes but learning from them sharing that information right like is that what you see is a, a different world where you, in a sense you're decentralizing the production of food yes. and information and then yes absolutely okay because um, that's fascinating so what you would i'm going to talk about the farm that i'm running right now and kind of our vision for it to give you an understanding of what um I think agriculture could be right, um, and perhaps this is a little bit utopian, and we know the problems with that. Uh, but I think it's something that we could uh, work towards. And it's if a, you were the agriculture minister, we could exactly. Get there, right? I would. I would. Uh, I would have my whip. I would impose it. <laughs> well, you, you have the added. <laughs> He's getting to a point. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you have the added um, uh, obstacle or challenge of you're still competing against. Like you have what you want to do and how you think things should be, but you still have these this massive, massive industrialized farms that you're competing against, right? right? So it's not like you're starting from scratch, but there's already sort of a barrier for you, right? right. You're competing against these guys. Yeah. So, anyways, go on about um, your farm. Just to answer that quickly, so right now with our business model, we are relying on people who see the quality of the food, and not necessarily just see the quality of the food. But um, I'll be honest, generally we're marketing towards a little bit higher income people who want to be sustainable um, and who also want good food and to feed their kids good food. And they, they, um, they see the quality difference and I think more than that, they recognize the problems in, in the current food and want something better. Yeah. Um, it might like I'm not talking about foodies here that just want good tasting food. I'm talking about people who want good quality food, uh, and it might actually like for someone who has eaten uh, like a prime or a, a triple A piece of prime rib uh, from the grocery store. You're used to that taste of beef. If you take the same cut of grass fed beef, it's going to taste different, and you might think initially that it doesn't taste as good. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> I could go on about this. Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're, that's, those are the people who we're relying on for our business model. Our food is more expensive. And part of that is because we're having to compete against 
an unfree market. But it's, it's, it's also market. people where your customers are going to make trade-offs and other right. things, right? They're going to say, I'm not going to do this right. because I believe in this. So, yeah. yeah, there's a trade-off there. I'm willing to spend um, yeah. whatever mm-hmm. more in food and not spend on this. On drugs so they're making or healthcare, a yeah. trips to the doctor. Whatever. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, anyways, what I see with my farm, we're on 100 acres, which with the style of farming that I'm doing is more than enough. Um, what's kind of recommended for two people is 40 acres. Um, now there's no hard and fast rule. We're not trying to centralize 40 acres, the 40 acre principle. <laughs> We're not trying to do any of that. Um, that's a but, good book title. The 40 acre principle. <laughs> Where did they live? Oh, this is a hundred acre wood. Yeah. <laughs> There's a pig in the forest. Yeah, well, there we go. There's connections there too. Um, but what we're trying to do is... You would be Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> There's way too much laughing for any of us to be Eeyores. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Go on. <laughs> this is a pretty good Eeyore voice. I could, I could be a Winnie the Pooh too, though. Yeah. Right? Getting stuck in a... In situations. Anyways, carry on, Mike. <laughs> so the vision we see for our farm is that out of that 100 acres, we have probably something like two or three acres of vegetable cultivation that is intensely managed. That's where the majority of our time goes. We have 15 to 20 acres that is dedicated to pig production, um, having pigs in their natural habitat, which is the forest, moving them through that. Not a lot of work because we're only really moving them every 10 to 12 days. And it doesn't take that long to move them. And they're, sorry, they stay in the forest? They stay in the forest. So I don't part pr- of your farm is a forest? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the rest of the acreage, uh, not all of it because I can't use it all for pasture, but the rest would be pasture and would be managed grazing. So similar to what we're doing with the pigs, we're moving... Uh, beef cows or sheep through that pasture using electric fence so so that they're always grazing fresh grass um, that benefits the grass that benefits the animals but that gives you kind of an idea we've got grazing animals we've got pigs in the forest we've got a small vegetable garden perhaps at one point we'd consider small scale uh, grains as well would you call that a garden like a small vegetable garden that's three acres or yeah, it's still generally referred like, to as a And garden. it's small, but it's productive. Like yeah. It's, okay. So the, the differentiation would be that it's, it's generally tended by hand rather right. than uh, Mechanized. mechanization. You know the hardest part of uh, growing beef? What? Is moving them around. <laughs> Did you just come up with that? Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like when you say hand work and moving things and whatever, we're actually kind of going back in time like that's the sense i get like oh, i don't want to do all that work because don't we have tractors and machines exactly. to do this like why like that would be an argument that yeah. pops up backwards heads, right yeah yeah we're going backwards it's like the electric car right we have great gas-powered cars that go forever and warm you up whatever and then we go backwards to electric but that's maybe a different thing but this <laughs> you yeah, know like do you run across this perception sure like, um, why would you pull all the weeds by hand is that what you do or uh yeah using yeah, using different implements. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Um, I'm not saying there is not a possibility of mechanization, but I don't think we're going to pursue that in our context. Right. Now, are we going backwards? Uh, well, it depends. It, it, has our development over the last 60 years been backwards? Right. Perhaps we've been developing in a backwards direction, in which case the best thing for us to do is turn around right. and, and develop in the opposite direction. Right. Um, if we are getting away from natural principles, then I think we're developing in a backwards direction. And a, a very obvious to me example is the idea of lab-grown meat. Lab-grown meat, I've read about it. Basically what it is, is it's actually, it's, I find it fascinating. It's massive tanks of bacteria that's growing. It's fermentation. So they're, they're growing these bacteria and at the end, like when they have enough of it, they just kill it and squish it into a hamburger patty or a chicken breast or whatever and that's what you're eating and it's it's not an unhealthy food source but the problem with it it, the problems are like there's tons of problems i mean (laughs) one is a massive vet of bacteria (laughs) just to me i don't know well it's like the essence of a monoculture they they can the biggest problem is that they can't have any other bacteria anywhere close to it so it has to be entirely sterile 
except for what's in that vat, right? So that's the, apparently that's the biggest failure point of that. They've developed this monoculture so specific that they can't have anything else in there. And that's, it's always going to force the price to be super high. So I see that actually as backwards development. We're pursuing this idea of efficiency to the point that we're going backwards. Yeah. Um, it's almost like you're fighting against God's design. Right. Directly. Like. Right. Exactly. I, I think so. Yeah. That's, that is exactly what I think. Uh, whereas if we go with God's design, we are moving forward. Um, then the progress and when will, you say moving forward we're, we're basically moving in the direction god wants us or intended right. us to go so whether or not we're going in circles or moving forward on this scale of getting better kind of thing right. like we're going with what god wants for us to do yeah. which is for his glory so isn't that always the the thing we do though as people right we I, we talked about you know history being cyclical versus linear yeah in the linear model we're always uh, uh, looking for progress we're always yep. getting better yeah and we always find these new and better ways to do things and that's the progress of mankind and then like we always realize a hundred years later or whatever like <laughs> oh yeah no that wasn't good at all that was bad yeah and i just feel like we're kind of doing the same thing uh yeah the same thing with with our food yeah uh as well and like i hadn't thought a lot about maybe organic farming but just food has it's been kind of on our like one of the things we we discuss right just sure. in general without knowing the answer yeah without thinking about you know some sustainable farming or how that actually works but just like i think a, a lot of people are aware that our food is bad and especially sort of in some of the spaces that we're in when you you get a lot of people who are like looking at bitcoin mm -hmm. um because it's not just about a Bitcoin and like making money, but it's right. about a, an alternative way of thinking about finance. And then that yeah. kind of affects everything else that you, you talk about. Yeah. We so should get into that too. Cause you mentioned mm -hmm. to me something about how Bitcoiners are interested. In <laughs> so that's very interesting. I did the, well, I did a shallow dive into Bitcoin a few years back. Um, there's a few things that, came out of that for me. You haven't fallen off the deep end. I haven't fallen off the deep end. Okay, good. It's just a shallow dive. Just there's a no, shallow there's dive. no rabbit holes on his farm. <laughs> you get some rabbits and then you can go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> you want to talk about farming rabbits. <laughs> um, so Bitcoiners, of course, have a long, most Bitcoiners, the Bitcoiners who support the Bitcoin principle. I don't know if you, have you guys talked about this much? No, we're getting into it. Okay. This is why we're getting we, there. Yeah. So just very briefly then. We have between us. Sure. Not just not on the podcast. We will. Yeah. There's a, a long time preference there, right? Yes. That they, they're purchasing Bitcoin expecting that this investment might, it might kind of bear fruit, might, yeah, bear fruit in 20 years, 50 years, not next year. Yeah. Um, the, the people who support the idea of Bitcoin, not, not the investors who are jumping in just trying to make a quick buck, but the people who support the idea have a long time preference. Um, Bitcoiners who have learned about sustainable farming love it. Just love the whole idea because I'll be completely honest. If I were trying to turn the, the fastest profit, I would stay in chickens yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. Um, I, my goal is to develop my farm and quite seriously, my farm probably won't be fully developed for probably something like 20 years. Yeah. Um, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the timeline that I got in the back of my mind. So there's this long-term time preference that sustainable farmers have. They're developing soil fertility, continuously improving food quality, but they're not going to necessarily see that next year. They might yeah. see it in 20 years, right? Um, so Bitcoiners love sustainable farmers. It doesn't always go the other way yeah. because sustainable farmers, I mean, we're still farmers, right? So uh, we like generally, and especially I would say in sustainable farmers, we like customers. low tech solutions. Oh, we like customers. We like customers. <laughs> we like low tech solutions and Bitcoin, no matter what, what way you do it is techie. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in a sense, uh, like gold. So that book there, you probably read, I'll give you that book, The Natural Order of Money. I think that would resonate with you quite well. Yeah. Um, but it's talking about the like nature's principles 
that govern monetary systems sure. versus like what we have now, which is you know man humans contr- like artificial production of versus Bitcoin, which is um, yeah we haven't even talked about this, but it's a different um, set of rules governing uh, right. its production. So you're talking about it's going to take you probably twenty years to develop your your farm. Um, your soil fertility is that going to go up? Over that time frame, is that that's kind of the idea, right? Yes, and the nutritional it's, value is going to go up. The, yes, which is like, I don't know. It's a, it's not exactly it's, in monetary terms. It's not deflationary. But when we think about Bitcoin, we think about something that actually is deflationary, as opposed to inflationary, which is our current money system, right? We, right. I have a hundred bucks next year. That's the purchasing power is actually ninety five dollars. Yeah, and and it, it goes down and down and down. And when you, it kind of resonated with me when you talked about this land that is no longer farmable. Right. And that just that blew my mind a little bit because like, you're farming. How can you ruin <laughs> land? Right. Unless you're pouring, you know, like um, Agent Orange on it. Like, how can you? How can land not be suitable for farming anymore? Like, unless you're salting it or something. Yeah. So. But that's kind of that. If that's what we're doing with our farming system, we're we're making stuff worse and we're making it less. And yeah, your time preference, of course, is going to be different on that. It's exactly like money, right? You're trying to extract something that's not there, and you're going to keep doing it. It's like going on drugs, right? It's like you want this drug, and you get like this huge high, and you're like, yeah. "Great, let's do it again," right? And then you get less, and then you get less, and then you get less, and you need more. And it's the same thing with the soil. Like you keep pulling stuff out of it, and then you're like, "There's nothing left." Well, but if I you need think it, of so it as a store of value, <laughs> right? If I'm going to invest in this land, totally. And that's going to be a store of value. That's something that will hold its value and probably increase its value. So I can give it to my kids later, like your kids. Um, Pro- uh, provided it's not expropriated. Well, yeah, no guarantees <laughs> there. Right? That's, another, <laughs> that's another problem we all face in real estate. You need to diversify your land plot so I'm one in each country. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one in Costa Rica. <laughs> so, yeah. but, uh, I think no, we, have to, we have to talk off the record a little bit. <laughs> No, it's it's so interesting, and that's so that's probably why Bitcoiners are interested because mm-hmm. um, there's just this common theme. Once yeah. you get past the sort of number go up idea of Bitcoin, and then people at some point, a lot of Bitcoiners are like, I don't really care about the price because I can see in the future we need a new economic system. Right. We need new money, and and it will mo- more than likely be Bitcoin. So I have a part of that, and uh, so I'm okay with with sacrificing whatever right now right. to be a part of that um later and that's just that that time preference like you said right i'm interested because you made the comment about a low-tech solution like farmers might be interested in low-tech solution what would you cash. say about current low-tech solutions like cash is a low-tech solution or <laughs> like <laughs> like that the current economic system we're running on with regards to of, economics yeah um the gold standard is a very low tech solution. It's just own a bunch of gold and hold it in your right. Um, earn somewhere. And of course, there's all sorts of problems with that, all sorts of challenges, which is why <laughs> Bitcoin was created. Um, there's all sorts of problems with the gold standard. One is gold is heavy to move around. Yeah. Right. And you have something that someone else can, if they find it, they can just grab and take with them. Yeah. So there's problems with the gold standard, uh, but that would be a a very real low tech solution yeah. to the economic issues. Cause I'm thinking of farmers of all people is really apparent. Um, cause you're working with the land and you're dealing with stuff that doesn't preserve well, right. That there's such a need for preserving value, right? Like you're producing value every day on the farm and especially at harvest time. Right. But then there's other times where it's like, okay, I wish I could store that value in something and then have that value, you know, when we're not producing vegetables in our field because it's minus 20 and there's Mm -hmm. snow on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably in farmers' heads going like, what are my options here? And I wonder if you ever thought about that or... Yeah, that's an interesting (laughs) question. Um, Because like, what do you do? What do you, what is the economics of a farm? Like, you produce for X number, like especially in this area of the world, you produce for so many months and then you harvest. Like that's a in the maybe the conventional model, but how how does your model work? Where it's not entirely dissimilar, although there is 
there are things that we can do to kind of mitigate the sort of boom bust cycle of, of conventional farming. Um, one of the things that we're working on developing is growing vegetables year round using protected uh, like hoop houses and stuff like that to protect vegetables, vegetables year round. So you have a little bit more consistent cash flow. Um, I feel like you're kind of leading with your questions because uh, <laughs> we wouldn't do that. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> like the, the conventional solution is like, well, you take in money from what you sell and then you save that money till next year till you have to buy your inputs again. Yeah. And it's like, well, then your money's 5% and your money has decreased in value by 5%. Okay. Well yeah. then let's use gold. The problem is go with gold is that you can't sign contracts in gold. And, <laughs> and then it's like, okay, well, Bitcoin, well, I can't prove, I can't pay my suppliers in Bitcoin, yeah. so there's problems there too. <laughs> yeah. But you're right, the, the monetary system that we have is not helping anyone yeah. except the government, let's be honest. It's helping the government stay in power. Um, an immediate or a, a slightly different perspective for me is what if I put my value in my land? Yeah. What if I'm developing my land fertility, my soil fertility, so that my land is actually my bank. Yeah. And I know I can put a seed in that ground and it will grow. And in, in even in two months, I will be able to sell something yeah. from my land, right? And in 10 years, you could put a seed in that ground and it might produce 30% more. Right. Is that kind of yeah. the idea as well? Yeah. It's like the law of uh, sowing and reaping. Or is that a law? That, uh, yeah, the biblical, that biblical principle, right? You can't reap what you don't oh, sow. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard that one. But yeah, to, like you mentioned it earlier, um, the conventional farming method is kind of by definition inflationary because the value of your land keeps decreasing. Yeah. Um, now, there's going to be, almost guaranteed, there's going to be critics who are listening to this who say, yeah, whatever, we've been doing this for 60 years and everything's still all good. People have been saying this for X amount of years and we haven't seen it happen yet. And that's because it doesn't happen fast. And I think that's by God's grace. Um, because we have this, like God's creation is so abundant um, that it kind of, in a way, makes up for man's sinfulness. God's grace makes up for man's sinfulness, right? Um, we won't see our our agricultural system like take a steep nosedive and stop producing food, and we'd all starve. No, we'll we'll gradually see yields decrease, and that is the story for a lot of farmers, especially in the states. Um, a lot of farmers who get into what I'm doing uh, do so because they can't get the yields off their land anymore. Mm -hmm. They just can't pay the bills. And yeah, they can still get maybe 70% of what they were, but that, it just doesn't pay the bills. And they're like, okay, we have to do something. We're going to start by decreasing inputs. We just can't afford the chemicals anymore. And then, okay, so they squeak out a few years and all of a sudden, after a few years, they start to see their yields increase again. They're like, but I'm not putting any inputs in. This is becoming more profitable. And then they start playing with other tactics like cover cropping or using grazing animals or whatever, and they start to see their profits rise. And they're starting to have to pursue unconventional markets, but they're profitable again. Interesting. So do you use any fertilizers? Like, do you buy fertilizer? So um, right now, we have not. Um, I can see in the future how we will buy fertilizer, but it will not be uh, synthetic fertilizers. It'll be things like uh, bone meal or blood meal, which are high in nutritional uh, or, or yeah, nutritional density for soil fertility. Um, or things like uh, chicken manure compost or horse manure compost, stuff like that. Um, organic matters that will promote fertility. Have you watched I, The Biggest Little Farm? Is that... <laughs> this is what is in my head, kind of. Yes. So <laughs> I have watched it. Um, I feel like I was probably a couple years late to the party, similar to Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I've never seen The Biggest Little okay, Farm. Yeah. So that's Very how most people that I've talked to about this... About it. Yeah, yeah. They've, they've seen that video and they're like, oh, it's like The Biggest Little Farm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is, actually. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
what I thought interesting was how in that movie, if, if people haven't watched it, I think it's on Netflix, The, the yeah. Biggest Little Farm. Um, it's about a farmer who basically takes a kind of arid plot of land and at, introduces biodiversity to promote soil quality and yeah. like basically make a farm out of this, right? And you think, yeah. oh, is that impossible? But I think it's like a seven-year... It was a seven-year process for them. ...project. So yeah. talk about time preference, right? Like right. he's he's going in expecting year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nothing. And then yeah. whatever, hopefully you can do it faster, but... So he introduces like a worm thing and whatever. yeah, they did all sorts of stuff. Um, so vermicompost, so it was worm composting. Yeah. Um, they made very, very fertile compost using worms. It's yeah. a really interesting idea. But how? And you the... don't have to pay them much. <laughs> no, <peanuts>. yeah. <laughs> Work for dirt. Yeah. <laughs> well, the what's interesting is when you talk about working with nature and these uh, in the in the film, they really pull out like, okay, well he. He worked with nature and then all of a sudden nature produced this massive abundance of something and that became a problem. So then all these pests, like all these pests came in and started eating it. Well, now like, you know, nature's fighting nature and right. it's a little bit confusing, I think, for the average person viewing it. Like, yeah. I don't know if that's how these farms operate and you're just constantly yeah. battling nature. A little bit, but um, there's a farming, though, isn't it? That's kind of farming. <laughs> and now there's a, there's a few different things that uh, are worthwhile understanding. Pests don't attack healthy plants. So if you, have, if you have healthy plants, the pest pressure will be very minimal. Really? Pests attack uh, plants that are weak. Um, weeds generally don't grow as easily in healthy soil. Weeds are meant for a purpose. Weeds are meant to cover bare ground. So if you, have, if you strip the sod off your grass, you leave it for three months, what's gonna happen? You're going to have weeds popping up from the seed bank. They're meant to cover bare ground and to deposit nutrients back in the ground to develop soil fertility. But if you have very fertile ground that you are tending very carefully and has loads of organic matter and you're not disturbing the seed bank, you'll have a lot less weed pressure. So that's what a lot of these market gardeners, guys who are intensively managing their gardens, that's what they find after, uh, let's say, five years. Your weed pressure goes down. Um, your soil is more fertile. It's easier to grow crops out of. You have to spend less time weeding, um, and you have great produce. Hmm. How are we for time on this? I feel like we just started talking. I don't even oh, know. Okay. We could cut this in half and make two episodes. Um, <laughs> I have one request. I should text my wife because it is noon and she's probably waiting for me for lunch. Oh. <laughs> Never, uh, never been on our podcast. We just tell our wives, like, I'll see you sometime. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. I don't Tune know. into the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm thinking of uh, beef production, for one, and how um, for a lot of farmers, it's been hard to... Like, it's hard if you're not producing like a gajillion cows mm -hmm. and to be able to get them to the slaughterhouse, right? Because mm -hmm. just economies of scale, there's no point in, because the, I think slaughterhouses have consolidated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it, it's, I don't know, this is probably just a plug for my brother-in-law, my sister, but um, they, uh, they produce mobile, or not mobile, modular, could be mobile as well, slaughterhouses. So where a farmer can just, cool. or a couple farmers can get together and be like, Hey, let's just have our own slaughterhouse, and then if we have a hundred head of cattle or whatever, right? Because that it's not it's become unsustainable, I think. Because I, I kind of asked him like, like, why are you doing this? Why there's slaughterhouses? Why can't you just? And it's like, yeah, most farmers are are either <clears throat> it's kind of go big or go home, right? Yeah. That that same same mentality because I think everything's consolidating, and then like, oh yeah, there's no more slaughterhouses in this state. Like you can have a whole state with nowhere to process your beef. Like yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. So they're producing and these the minimums. Like you have to have a hundred head or something. I yeah. don't know what the minimums right. are, but I'm just thinking. Well, it's it's huge numbers, yeah. right? To the yeah. point where <laughs> something like sustainable, if you want to have like a dozen cows or something and produce beef, well, either you're going to be really busy like hand butchering them all the time, or um, or not. So I, did, I guess the point is, I think there's like the market will find solutions to these things as well, right? Yeah. You have all these 
because you, you know you're talking about you got some pasture and if you have 100 acres well you're not going to have a thousand cattle no right you can't have that that's why you guys four you kids have, they're all going to be uh, <laughs> slaughtering <laughs> so but that's a long-term right. time preference thing too right, <laughs> that's you're, right. you're you're probably well, busy <laughs> but kids are a long-term time preference absolutely yeah, yeah wow well, but i mean they can also help you pull weeds so i mean that's you know 100%. within five years or so you're getting some return, right? <laughs> but i think the market can also produce solutions yeah uh, if we let it yeah if we let it so um, I can talk a little bit on that with conventional agriculture um, when you talk a conventional slaughterhouse you're talking astronomical numbers of animals going through there like it, it blows your mind um, it's tough to, for me to put a number on it because I don't know exactly but something like a hundred thousand chickens a day is not out of the question right so these are huge chickens sports. And they're designed purely with efficiency in mind. So if you have, if your slaughterhouse is set up for exact example, a, a two kilogram bird and you have a farmer that produces 10,000, two and a half kilogram birds. No, not happening. He's not getting his animals slaughtered there. Huh. It will not work. The machines are all set up for a two kilo bird yep. and they're not going to change it for 10,000 birds. Yeah. Right. So in, in beef terms, you were talking about beef. Imagine a farmer who does his own thing, um, has his own beef on pasture, and 10% of his cows grow a little bit fast, 10% grow a little bit slow, and he tries to get them all into the same processing plant. You know what? They're going to have serious problems with it because there's different sized cattle, and they just can't process them as quickly as the rest, right? So that... So you got to make changes to how you grow the beef. Exactly, which means you are controlling their diet exactly. You're giving them all the exact same diet. If there's animals that are getting large, you feed them a little bit less. If there's animals that are small, you feed them a little bit more um, to get everything the same. But, but life isn't the same, right? Yeah. And, and I, it's not in our control to, to equalize all the playing fields, to equalize everyone, right? It's not in our control to do that. Um, life isn't the same. We can't pretend that it is. So we've developed this, this crazy system of agriculture that's completely unnatural to try and become as efficient as possible. Um, now, modular slaughterhouses that, um, or yeah, modular, you said it's modular slaughterhouses, right? Small units that you can um, bring to an area fairly quickly and set up and um, a little bit more versatile so you can put different size animals through. I, like, you're right, it is, a, it is a way that the market is responding. But the problem is, particularly in a Canadian context, is that regulation is so heavy on small slaughterhouses <clears throat> that it's very tough for them to stay in business. Yeah, I don't think they market in Canada, to be honest. I think it's all the states. You're probably right. So Canada has much tougher laws on uh, slaughterhouses and on things like raw milk. You brought that up earlier. Raw milk is illegal in Canada, illegal to sell. Um, where is it going with this? Oh yeah, so that is one of the one of the pretty serious issues that might affect us if regulation continues to increase and we can no longer have animals butchered uh, through a small slaughterhouse direct sale to our customers. I'm not 100 percent sure what we'll do because it's entirely possible that the regulation, the regulatory framework, will go that way to further centralize and further centralize food production for higher efficiency. So That's, if you want to do what you got to do, you got to move somewhere else. I either have to move somewhere else or do it illegally. Right. And there are farmers who do either one. I, I know yeah. farmers who do either one. Wow. Is or it, I know of farmers. I'll say, I should yeah. say I know of farmers. Yeah. Isn't it crazy that like, this has come up for me in a lot of different conversations lately, especially on real estate is what we do. Um, but even Bitcoin, like regulatory risk it's like the biggest risk we face in so to many any different investment areas. that you make. And it's like, hold on a minute. We're just, we're just making this stuff up. <laughs> Regulatory, like that's just the yeah. thing, rules that we're making. And how can this be the biggest risk for investing in real estate? I do short term rentals for short term yeah. rentals yeah. for, for all like, that's ridiculous. It should be like, yeah. I don't know the weather is the biggest <laughs> right. risk or like uh, I don't know an invading army it's essentially right. ourselves Not like our we are our biggest risk <laughs> restricting what we can do and I mean yeah there's there's place for rules and stuff but uh, I don't know that, that blows my mind regulatory risk I just want to grow cows man I want yeah. to give people good nice big 
T-bones and ribeyes. Next time we're going to have a vegetarian on or something. <laughs> <laughs> See how that podcast goes. <laughs> I, I mean, if you want to do that, just play by the rules. But you're still subject to, yeah. to the regulatory framework, and it might change on you. If, if you put your trust in the government, you might lose everything, right? Really? You could be confident that interest rates are going to stay low for a very long time. Have we heard that one before? <laughs> yeah, last week. The bank <laughs> went out well. Like a year and a half ago, right? Governor of the Bank of Canada. And he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, we gotta, we got to raise rates. So everybody that, you know, listen to me, sorry, you're going to lose, lose everything. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, another question for you. Do you. I don't know if you <laughs> know this. Us. Sorry, this is how I, this is how I work. Um, do you know how many people farm now? Versus a hundred years ago, because I, like I think that number has dropped drastic, drastically, right? Yes, it's dropped drastically. So uh, I don't know the exact proportion, but it's something like a few percent. Um, it's a fraction of the population. Whereas, I mean, if you go back far enough, everyone was involved somehow in food production. Yeah. Uh, I I want to say in the 1950s it was something like 50 percent of the population, but now it's like a few percent. Three percent, I think, is yeah. what I heard. Yeah, of, of people are farmers. Yeah. Right. So, um, that's usually said to be a good thing. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. We're more right. efficient than everything else. But my question, kind of, is: Is it a good thing? Farmers are always saying people should know where their food comes from. People have to be more connected with their food. They're also saying we can't find good employees. Yeah. Right. So there's this idea that the the fewer people. From our, from our population that work on farms, the better. But then farmers are complaining that, no, we need people to work on farms. We need people to know where their food is coming from. We need people to be involved. So what, which is it? Um, my preference would be to see more people work on farms. Um, there is a, a certain uh, value attributed to good work on farms, um, to working with your hands, acknowledging that you are dependent on things like soil fertility, you're dependent on the weather, ultimately you're dependent on, on God's grace in your life, right? Um, he controls all of that. So um, I would like to see more people work on farms. Um, and my, <coughs> one of the things I wanted to bring up was that we have this idea that we've gotten so much more efficient with farming. What are we actually efficient with? Are we, are we efficient with uh, yield per acre, calories produced per acre of farm, farmland farmed? And I would say no, there are systems that we can produce more. Are we efficient with our money use? No, the overhead for farming is astronomical. It's ridiculous. Uh, people, can, people can make profit. People can make a living on a farm without that overhead. It's possible. There's many people doing it. Are we efficient with uh, our land? I think I did land already. Um, what else was there? There were a couple of other things that I was thinking, but ultimately the only, the only metric of efficiency that we are actually succeeding at is man hours worked per calorie produced um, because a lot of that is, it's all mechanized, right? Yeah. So is that the only metric of efficiency that we should be pursuing? I don't think so. I think it's a very, it's a very um, limited idea. We've, we've very much limited ourselves. <clears throat> Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, progress, but food what, for thought. What, what <laughs> ah, I knew that one was gonna have to come up at some point. Wow. All right. Okay. Mike, are there any other points you wanted to make, or I don't know, things that have come up in our conversation that you're like, oh, we really got to. Um, well, okay. One of the stuff. things that I didn't ask said, you, Brent. One of the things Mike. that said, "Hey, we should have Mike on in the first place," was he actually ran a podcast. I don't know if we want to mention that, but. He's yes, a farmer and right. he started a farm, but he also, he had a podcast going for a few years or a that's, year or not awful, even uh, a year. It's awful high tech for a farmer. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I, I did run a podcast for a little bit. Um, it was a lot of work. I keep prompting you to bring it back, but. Uh, <laughs> Were you like uh, chasing the pigs while you were recording or like. No, I wasn't. Like, writing, a, writing a big one. Big although I was I did a couple episodes like recording as I was driving to try fit it in somewhere <laughs> sound quality probably suffered <laughs> um, yeah I ran a podcast I called it one Christian thinks as in I am just one Christian 
or I'm just one person, I am a Christian and I am thinking about things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I try to tackle some of the bigger issues uh, that were occurring. This was primarily uh, kind of around the area of uh, the start of COVID or all around the era of the start of COVID. Yeah. Um, around there, discussing role of government, discussing freedom, other um, uh, social justice matters, stuff like that. Yeah. So if people want to learn more about Mike, then uh, they should go check that <laughs> yeah. out. Or you kind of put that in your past. <laughs> no, it is still it is still up. I haven't listened to anything. Yeah. Um, so I might have a bit of a different perspective now. I don't know. But you're welcome to listen to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, like some of that stuff was on point, right? Especially around like the social justice movements and stuff. Right. Which I feel like people are much more bold to talk about now. But even like two years ago, like you didn't yeah. say anything about any of these movements. Right. Because, uh, like, yeah. That was it, Do you so. find that there's overlap between some of those? Because clearly you've done a lot of reading and studying around that content. And now you've also done a lot of the same sort of reading and studying around farming practices. Right. You find there's overlap between things that you're learning and discovering in both? Or um, absolutely. It kind of, yeah? Because it all comes down to worldview, right? And, and we've touched on that a little bit. What is your what is the basic framework that you're establishing your whole uh, philosophy off of, right? right? Um, I graduated not that long ago. I was a, a mature student in an undergraduate program in criminology, which is basically just a mixture of sociology, psychology, and law. So I did study a lot of those social justice movements, and that's kind of where I came up with the idea uh, for this podcast because I wanted to relay this information um, that was a was a different way of thinking than was most common. I wanted to relay it to other people. Um, there might be a theme here in me just thinking crazy things, but <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to make okay. sure that the world knows that perhaps that's crazy. <laughs> perhaps that's the only theme that I just try to think differently now than more everyone else. People know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's the underlying worldview, and there's there can be a lot of different ways to to define this worldview. Um, but there's a consistency between um, allowing the experts to figure it out for you uh, so that you no longer have responsibility. There's an avoidance of responsibility on the part of the individual and putting that responsibility on experts. And of course, that means centralization of power, right? A government has to be a big government if you're going to depend on them for everything. Um, if you want a government to resolve your problems and they might be very real problems don't get me wrong but if you want a government to fix that it's going to have to be a big government and you're probably not going to like that big government when it's not helping you yeah right mm -hmm. um and so that's one theme that runs through those social justice movements and also runs through with what i'm seeing in agriculture now there's like definitely not taking things. responsibility right the individual level right um short-term pleasure yeah uh, versus a, a long-term time preference those ideas right. definitely I think that's, I mean, that's so much of what we talk about as well, right? In one way or another. Yeah. That just runs through our lives now because we have big government. We have fiat money. And yeah. that just affects how uh, how everything in our lives uh, looks, what it looks like, yeah. how we live. Totally. Yeah. And in a, in a very, making it very simplistic is that ultimately it's the mark of sin in our lives, right? Um, we're all fallen men and um, we have that continuous battle inside of us of not wanting to take responsibility for who we are, not wanting to take responsibility for our sins. Um, hmm. Thank God we have a gracious savior who's taken responsibility on him and then we just have to live out our lives accordingly. <clears throat> yeah, amen oh, to that. Man. <laughs> we could go on for a round. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll have to have yeah, you back on for episode <laughs> two where we talk about I, I haven't even touched on my notes here so <laughs> six pages of notes <laughs> so we normally do. Okay. yeah I think this would be a good spot to wrap it for uh, for today yeah so uh, yeah thanks so much for being with us Mike yeah Appreciate thanks for it. having me um, and uh, Brent I guess thanks for being here too yeah man. <laughs> thanks for having me too <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, we'll link to your uh, stuff some of the books you mentioned I think sure. would be helpful yeah uh, just if people want to learn more about the topics and then also your uh your farm is called the farm is called the good ground the good okay. ground natural farm if you want to find us uh we have a website uh at thegoodground.ca 
Um, on that website, we have like a contact us panel, so you can subscribe to email newsletters and you can send me an email if you want. That's all good. Um, and then we also have an Instagram, which is a bit of a fun page. Okay. I don't control the Instagram. If I controlled the Instagram, it'd be a whole lot more boring and dry. Yeah. Uh, someone else controls the Instagram, so it's actually Everyone a Everyone needs space. to take personal responsibility. <laughs> yeah. that, that message gets old after a yeah. while. Do you also have a physical location? Yeah, we absolutely do have a physical location. We're not. <laughs> This isn't merely just philosophy. Okay. Um, yeah, we're just south of Beamsville um, in the Niagara region. Uh, okay. We are working on establishing kind of a, a, a area on the farm where people can come and purchase things. But that's uh, we're, we're a very young farm. Uh, that's all in development. Yeah. So. Okay. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks again. Thanks yeah, for listening, thanks, folks, Mike. if you made it this far. And uh, until next time. Steward your wealth wisely. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Two Stewards Show. If you like my voice better, click subscribe. And if you like my voice better, click share. If you like both, give us a five-star rating. To interact with the show, feel free to reach out at hello at twostewards.ca. We'll see you in the next episode. In the meantime, steward your wealth wisely.